Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Metastellar YouTube channel. My name is Maria Korolov. I'm the editor here at Metastellar. And are you looking for some free science fiction and fantasy books to get you through the weekend? Because we have them. This week, we have A Plague, A Sexy Dragon, Witches, Wizards, and a modern-day retelling of the Snow White story. But before we get to all that, hi, and welcome back to the channel. And I want to thank um, editor E.S. Foster for helping me out today with the reviews. And Emma is here with us today. Hi, Emma. Hey. Um, and let's skip over all the boring administrative stuff and get right into the books. Um, with We're going to start with book number five, and we're going to count down to book number one. And let me make that a little bit bigger for you guys so you can see it. A Tempest of Discovery by Sarah Craddock is the first of four books in the Midnight Dynasty Paranormal Romance series, and it is free today on Amazon. The link is in the description box below, so you can click it and get it. It won't stay free for long. Authors and publishers make books free in order to promote the first book of the series. So um, we have some fantastic authors, including a couple of uh, best-selling authors on today's list. So these books are hot. Grab them while they're still free. Okay, so um, so so this is uh, first of four books. The other books are $5 each, and they're not in Kindle Unlimited. Kindle Unlimited is where you pay 12 bucks a month and you read all the books you want. So if you like this book, you will have to pay for the others. Um, now, um, this this particular series is also related to another series by the same author, uh, the 12 book series, The House of Crimson and Clover. And the first book of that series is also free today. Um, the author says you don't have to read that book to enjoy this one. But if you like the author, definitely pick up that other book as well. So this book opens with a list of characters and several family tree diagrams, which worries me a little bit because I have a problem with names. And also those kind of books tend to be full of drama, family drama, and I don't like drama. Um, and uh, the book starts in New Orleans, New Orleans in the present day of 2007. So, I mean, a lifetime ago, really. Um, and um, it's about Nicholas, who is heir to his dynasty, a family of witches and wizards. He used to be a depraved rogue, but wants to change and is no longer afraid of commitment or family. And he wants to show his family that he's changed. The only one who believes him is, the aunt, is his aunt Colleen. She's the closest thing he's got to a parent. And his aunt wants him to investigate another powerful witch family. And for this investigation, he's paired up with a woman he's in love with, but she just knows him as the idiot he used to be. So kind of common romance, a trope except in a setting with you know witches and wizards and so on and so and there's a lot of backstory about what's happening with the family at the beginning of the book and then we switch to the point of view of another woman charlotte she's just resigned a legal internship for the louisiana aclu asked for a leave from her law studies what went to a firing range to practice her shooting and Aunt Colleen is Charlotte's father's cousin. And Aunt Colleen has an assignment for Charlotte as well. Uh, she has to go to Paris to meet with someone named Julian, whom she loves, but who's too young, sweet, and innocent for a family assignment. They're supposed to investigate an illusionist and her brother who can change their appearances. And Colleen wants to know if they're going to be allies or enemies. And the illusionist brother's picture captures Charlotte's eye and she's immediately drawn to him. And then we get more backstory. Then we switch to the point of view of Lauren. She's the one who's teamed up with Nicholas, the first guy. They're getting ready for their assignment. They're discussing family issues. Um, Nicholas' sister's pregnant. He's going to be an uncle. Oh, you know, other stuff. And then they go investigate that other witch family. So, a lot of family drama. The book starts really slowly for my taste. There are way too many potential romantic couples. The, the plot isn't really getting going for me. And I'm worried that the plot is going to be secondary to the romance. 
But if you like family sagas with a lot of romance and with a magical setting, you can pick this up. I know a lot of people do. And also pick up that other book in the related series as well. I'm going to post a link to that book in the description box as well. All right. Next, we have the Snow White retelling. If you're a fan of magical romances, it's another one for you. Snow So White by Seagockle is the first of five books in the urban magic and folklore, folklore a romantic fantasy series by a USA Today bestselling author. The other books are 3 to $5 each, and they're not in Kindle Unlimited, and the author has been on our Free Friday list before. And Emma read this book for us. Emma, what did you think? Yeah, so I really enjoyed the premise of the story. I thought it was really interesting. So the story opens with Cherry, and she's this young woman. She's seemingly being held hostage by these two men on a bus. And she's trying to convince them that she has magic because they also do. And she's saying, hey, I'm one of you. You don't need to hurt me. But then all of a sudden, this mysterious creature comes in front of the bus and the men start shooting at it. So then it cuts back to Cherry attempting to get some food at the grocery store earlier that morning. Her grandmother has just passed away, so she's struggling to cope. But it's revealed in a backstory, which I thought was still really cool, even though it was a ton of backstory, that... The mysterious force swept over the world years ago, and it destroyed pretty much all of modern technology. So now all these mythical creatures like dragons and sea monsters roam the lands, and people possess all these kinds of magic. And also, fake creatures regularly travel through this sleepy town that Cherry lives in. Jack Frost also exists in the story, and he acts as like a protector to the town. So Cherry comes in to the grocery store. One of the shopkeepers mentioned that it's likely that the queen, that's the only name we know her by, will now be able to see the town through her magic mirror. Because previously, Jack Frost had cast a spell to keep her from being able to see it. Because this queen has been searching for all kinds of people and animals to use during this magical war going on in the south. So Cherry hopes that Jack can keep her and her friends safe as the queen starts drawing closer. The story then shifts to Jack's perspective because he's trapped in a dream, like this dream world type of thing, and he's forced to use mirrors to see and talk with people in the real world. So that's how he communicates with everybody. He comes across Cherry and her grandmother years ago when Cherry was just a kid. It was after he had woken up from a curse that the queen had placed on him. So it goes back to the present after this backstory and he's wandering through the dream world, he's checking the mirrors, he realizes that the spell he placed on the queen in return to keep the town safe is now weakening. So soon the queen's going to know where the town is, so Cherry is going to end up striking a bargain of some kind, she's going to team up with Jack, and they're going to figure out how to stop this queen. So I really like this story, like I like the premise of it, all the magical creatures, the idea of a dream world, and the things like these passing details mentioned called like the vampire wars, details like that, they just sounded really cool. And there were a few places where I wasn't sure what was happening, but the pace was steady and I thought the prose was really interesting, especially the parts where it was like the backstory of Cherry and her grandmother. I thought that was really well written. So I also haven't read a whole lot of urban magical fantasy and I feel like this is probably going to be my new favorite genre. So I'm definitely going to keep reading. I do love urban fantasy. So um, it, it's definitely up there when it comes to favorite genres. If you want to listen to some book recommendations, I, I can give you a million. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. All right. Now, book number three on today's list. Let me make that a little bit bigger. World of Blood by Kate L. Mary. The first of three books in the Cursed World, a post-apocalyptic survival series. The other books are four dollars four dollars each but they are both in kindle unlimited and the author has been on our free friday list before so i'm not no normally a fan of post-apocalyptic novels they look hit a little bit too close to home for me i want my escapist reading to be less realistic so read this review with a grain of salt because i know a lot of people do like these kind of stories so the book opens on a fishing boat in the bay of bengal in the year 2026 
um, there's an old fisherman who's taken an American missionary to secluded island, an island that's off limits to visitors. So there's an isolated, violent tribe living on this island. And the local uh, authorities, the India, are trying to preserve their isolation and protect them from modernity. And there's a local legend that says that the, this tribe is so determined to keep people out, not because they want to be protected from the outside world, but because they're protecting the outside world itself. So the missionary offers the fisherman a lot of money. So the fisherman takes him close to the island the missionary gets his kayak, they drop it into the water, and um, the missionary paddles off to the island where he is promptly killed by the locals. And the fisherman can't do anything about it. He's just like seeing this from, happen from a distance, turns around and heads home. So after this incident, the Indian government and the US government start arguing about what they're gonna do about this. The U.S. president wants to send in a team to retrieve the body and make the killers pay. And a lot of countries are opposed to that, including India, because what was the missionary doing there anyway? And then there's like the religious groups are, you know, clamoring to, you know, to get the missionary's body and to do something about all this. So it, it's a whole thing. Then in the next chapter, we switch to the point of view of one of the special ops soldiers who's going to be going to this island. And they're supposed to dig up the body and bring it home. And they're not supposed to, you know, get into a fight with anybody, but they also are ordered to do whatever they got to do to bring the body back. And things go wrong. Locals wind up getting killed. But the team kind of succeeds in their mission of bringing the body home. So that was that was the first two chapters. It was all told in the third person. And that was kind of like a prologue because in chapter three, we meet the real protagonist and we switch to a first person view. And the protagonist is Andra, a novelist and a single mom. And she's at home in Ohio checking Facebook when her 14 year old daughter comes in. And her daughter is complaining about this news story about the missionary and the island. And, and she's not a fan of what the missionary did. Um, and so they talk about this a little bit. Then Andrew drives her daughter to school, drops her off. And on the way back, the missionary story is on the radio. And so when she gets home, she Googles it to find out more about it. And winds up watching a late night talk show with a soldier who, who killed the first islander is being interviewed. And the soldier is coughing and his eyes are bloodshot and he's sweating. So I'm guessing that the soldier is sick and he's infected everybody. But before we get to any of that juicy, you know, plague spreading uh, storyline, there's more backstory about Andra and her daughter, her daughter's father, and how they met and their relationship, and who's going to be picking up the kid at school. So I don't think I'm going to be sticking with this book. The writing is easy to read. It does draw you in, but I don't like the whole plague subject matter. And the book does take a while to get going. Uh, not that I want the disaster to happen, but no, I kind of do. But anyway. So if you do like these kinds of stories, then check it out. The book is free. Uh, then um, back to romance and back to New Orleans and back to magic. We have The Dragon of New Orleans by Genevieve Jack. The first book in a 10 book series, The Treasure of Paragon by a New York Times bestselling author. The other books are $5 each, and they're not in Kindle Unlimited, and the author has been on our free Friday list before. So, Ravenna is in the hospice, dying of brain cancer, and the only thing she's happy about is that she can donate her organs. She's half paralyzed on a morphine drip. She had chemo. She had surgeries. This is the end. And then death himself shows up, or at least it's a guy who isn't wearing medical scrubs, who stops time. Literally, the IV stops dripping, the clock stops. 
And um, so this is the end. And she's only surprised by one thing, that death is a real hunk. Dark, brooding, scruffy. And um, so I'm picturing him kind of like Tom Ellis in the TV show Lucifer. Um, because, also because of the book cover. I mean, from he kind of looks like Tom Ellis there. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the show Lucifer. And the visitor turns out to be Gabriel. And Gabriel is an immortal dragon, or he used to be immortal. There's a voodoo curse that's making him sick. Um, so uh, Gabriel saw an old newspaper article where Ravenna had a premonition of a fire, uh, caused her parents to buy a new fire extinguisher, which saved their business and their lives. So he thinks she's psychic. And he's shocked by how awful she looks. Nothing at all like a newspaper picture. Uh, she used to be an honors anthropology student with a minor in history. So he offers her a job. If she consents, he can use what little magic he's got left to bind her. Unless the cancer has taken so much of her mind that she can no longer consent, then the magic won't work. And she says yes. So he pulls out a tooth, a gi giant dragon tooth out of his mouth, turns it into a pill and tosses it in the down the back of her throat and then time starts moving again and yeah i'm caught up in the story i am not a fan of romantic fantasy but i i want to see where this is going yeah um so before we get to book number one on today's list I want to thank our Patreon supporters, including our newest patron, Elizabeth Levin. Thank you so much. So um, at Metastellar, we publish a ton of um, science fiction and fantasy and horror short stories. We've published more than a thousand um, short stories and articles since we launched uh, four years ago. And we are able to pay for this fiction because of donations. All of our editors work as volunteers. So all the money that comes in through Patreon and through direct donations goes to paying for original science fiction and fantasy. So we thank you guys. We love you. We literally would not be here without you. Oh, and those short stories also make it into our anthologies. We have three anthologies. Um, the first two are already out. The links are in the description box below. This third one, you guys are now seeing for the first time before anybody else has seen it, including Emma. This is her first time seeing it. And it's looking kind of weird because the green in the cover is picking up on from the green screen. But... um. So yeah, this book will be out and available for sale like any minute now, as soon as we 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 finish with a little bit of the proofing. So uh, thanks um, again, all paid for due to our Patreon supporters. So thanks guys. Um, and um, I wanna thank um, Emma E.S. Foster and um, got a link to her editorial services company in the description box below. And I have some books up on Amazon, um, which are also linked below. Okay, so on to book number one on today's free science fiction and fantasy bestseller list. The Quantum Curators and the Fabergé Egg by Eva St. John is the first of five books in the Quantum Curators, a romantic science fiction adventure series. The other books, five to six dollars each, but they are all in Kindle Unlimited. And Emma read this book for us. Emma, what did you think? I also really enjoyed this one. Like I did my other review and I enjoyed it. This one I also enjoyed. It was really cool. So it starts out with um, this woman named Neith and her team of these people called quantum curators. And basically what they do is they're in charge of going back in time to different places. And they find important artifacts that will be valuable in the present. They're not valuable then, but it's different things like if you go back and take something from the Library of Alexandria before it burns down, that type of thing. 
So sometimes they need to even perform these quantum leaps to a parallel parallel Earth. So it's called Beta Earth versus Alpha Earth. And sometimes they have to go there to find these pieces, which I thought was really cool. So their next artifact is actually Excalibur, but Neith isn't too happy about it because she has to jump into a freezing lake to get it. She's forced to swim to the bottom, and she has to hold out her hand for the sword, like the Lady of the Lake. So it's like the legend sort of comes true, and it's part of the curator's job to make sure that everything that is supposed to happen in the timeline is fulfilled. So luckily, retrieving Excalibur goes without off without a hitch and she and her teammate Cleo they're able to quantum leap back to the earth that they belong to because they're from Alpha Alpha Earth. Back on Beta Earth it switches to the perspective of Julius. He's a Cambridge professor. He's working as an artifact caretaker for a museum and he meets up with this friend who's kind of like an Indiana Jones type of character. He tells him about one of the artifacts that he just found. It's a Russian nesting doll. But inside the doll, there's a note describing a Fabergé egg. And this friend guesses that this egg was lost during the Russian Revolution, so it's therefore really valuable. So Julius is immediately interested, and he promises to do some research on it. So meanwhile, Neith and her teammate back on the Alpha Earth, they report their Excalibur finding, but Neith is giving her next mission. She practically has nothing to go on for this mission. She needs to find a priceless Fabergé egg, but none of the quantum curators know which Earth it happens to be on, and she also has to figure out what time period it is, so she doesn't have really anything to go on. So that's as far as I got, but um, Neith and Julius's paths eventually cross, and it looks like they're going to look for the egg together, just as long as they don't die first. So like I was saying, I really enjoyed the premise of the story, especially the idea of parallel Earths and finding artifacts in all these different time periods. The story did kind of slow down in some areas, like there were places where there was lots of exposition, but I found the information so cool and was really into it and invested that I didn't really mind all that much. I also love Neat's voice because her sections are in first person, Julius is in third por- person, which I thought was interesting, but whenever we get in her head, it's like she's complaining about all of the annoying parts of her job, like paperwork and swimming in a cold lake. So I think I might continue with this series. This reminds me a lot of the Domesday book and To Say Nothing of the Dog by Kanye Willis. Have you read that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love those books so much. They're some of my favorite books. So I'm going to check this out as well. And um, if any of you readers out there uh, check out these books, let us know in the comments below what you thought. And if you don't want to miss any of these free Fridays, subscribe to our channel or to our newsletter. The link is in the description box below. Meanwhile, if you don't want to leave our channel just yet, we're serializing Gods and Monsters, which is um, a a book about vampires set in the 1980s by an award-winning artist and author E.E. King. And our interview with the author is here. And the recording of the author reading the the first installment of the book is here. We're now up to installment 23 on both our website and on this channel. Subscribe if you don't want to miss anything. Thanks, guys. I love you. We'll see you all next Friday. Bye-bye. Bye.